The Cultural Heritage of the Kurpia Region of Poland, Part 1. Oh, how the times have changed. Why, it's the end of the world. I used to say only one part of the rosary. Now, I have to say all four. Welcome to one of the few remaining wooden buildings in the village. In it, an exhibit of the interior, typical of a Kurpia region cottage. We are in the large room and its permanent display. This cottage dates from the second half of the 20th century and was divided into four rooms, the vestibule, the small room used for preparing meals, the large room with its characteristic and elegant interior and the alcove. The altar was the centerpiece of the large room. This was the focal point of the spiritual life of the Kurpia family. This is where the bride was led off to be wed. It was here that a son was sent off to serve in the army. Here is where the infant, about to be christened, would be dressed. Here also was where the typical Kurpia region carved cross were hung. People from the Kurpia region would go on pilgrimage to the shrine at Częstochowa and from there would bring back holy water in special bottles. This water was poured into a special container at the door. In the Kurpia region, you always began the day by dipping your finger into the holy water and making a sign of the cross. Usually at Easter, the large room was cleaned with hot water. All the dust and stains from cooking were washed from the walls, which were then whitewashed, and thus the house was disinfected. Kurpia women used shears to make all sorts of paper cutouts and decorations. As a result, the houses were very colorful. Depending on the phase of development, the cottage would have a trunk, or later in the 50s a wardrobe, a spoon rack, initially a single one, and of course plates, which were a display of the peasant family's wealth. Daily meals were eaten on clay plates and painted ones on holidays. There was also basic pottery. There were pound cake forms and containers for milk. There were graters for making potato pancakes. There was a stove. Until the mid-20th century, cooking was done directly on the stove. Later, pots were used. Irons were heated on the stove as well. Next to the stove stood the water pail, made from a solid tree trunk, sometimes burned out in earlier times. Above the stove was the ceiling shelf where the bread was kept. Norvid, the poet of the Mazovsha region, wrote that to this land where a crumb of bread is raised in respect, it was here in the Kurpia region that the family ritual involving bread originated. Here bread was respected. Of course a towel hung above the water pail and there was a small shelf for the salt box and other odds and ends. And so this is what the most elegant part of a Kurpia cottage looked like.
We are now in the alcove of the cottage. I'm sitting on an extensible bed. The bed had a straw-filled pallet. It was extended at night, and this is where the husband and wife slept, very often with a baby between them. Most families were large. During the day, the bed was collapsed, and the straw was covered with a linen cloth. The bed itself was covered with a lovely homemade woven material. One or two pillows, often with several smaller ones, were found on the bed. The more pillows, the more elegant the cottage. The cradle stood next to the bed and was often decoratively carved. Very often, if babies cried at night, one could be put to sleep by putting it to the breast and the other one rocked to sleep. The alcove also contained a sewing machine. Not all cottages had one, but if they did, this is where it stood. This is where the goat also stood. It was a strange piece of furniture, used at home, but also taken outside, to the forest when picking blueberries, to the meadows when raking hay, and to the fields when digging potatoes. It was very light, a pillow was put in it, and a child quickly fell asleep, because the fields, meadows, and forests of the Kurpi region were so fragment. Of course, the alcove also had a perch, a simple rod nailed to the ceiling, on which the peasant family hung its clothes. Here we are in the small room, where the work of preparing meals was done. On the left, we see everything needed to do such work. Notice the stool used to make cottage cheese, the kneading bowl used for bread carved from a single tree trunk. First of all, it shows how large the families were with such large loaves of bread. And secondly, the size of the trees that grew in the region. Women in the Kurpia region spent many of their married years pregnant. Perhaps it was difficult for them to carry water in large buckets, also made from a single tree trunk. So they also had smaller ones like these. Here we see a container used to separate milk, also carved from a single tree trunk. Metal tin cans began to appear in the middle of the 20th century. Here we have a utensil for buckwheat, which had to be pounded, picked through, then sifted. Every small room in every Kurpia cottage had a utensil for millet, which was harvested and threshed, transferred into this container and pounded. The husks were pounded off and later sifted outside in the wind. Porridge, made with millet, was an important food product in the Kurpia village. A characteristic feature of this utensil is that it dates from the 18th century and was made by burning out a single tree trunk. Later on they were carved out, but earlier they were burned. A fire was set and the glowing embers were kept away from the walls, and after a time the utensil was ready. Millet, in general, was a grain for poor folks. You only needed to sow a handful, and you'd reap plenty, for each grain produces many sprays. We also have a butter churn. Of course, Protagoras from Adber said, man is the measure of all things, and the first weights and measures used in the Kurpia region were called bedsmers. 
Of course, there were a few rodents too, and so bacon or salted meat was stored in simple closed containers to protect it. The spoon rack was very simply made and held various jars, crock pots, salad bowls, and a small fiance jug. Here we have a bed that was called a schlaban. It was expanded at night to twice its width, but during the day it was covered with a board on which you could sit. Where did the strange name come from? Often an 18-year-old girl in this region was one step away from being married. Before the wedding, she no longer slept with her sister, she slept alone. And from this sleeping alone, called Shlubunek in Old Polish, the bed came to be known as a Shlaban. And now, let's strike up the band.